Oh, the lights are bright up here. Thank you very much. I want to thank Asan for the invitation to this very, very interesting uh, session that they've arranged on North Korea. Uh, it's the first one I've been able to attend in quite some time, and I'm truly in, enjoying it uh, very, very much. Um, we have a very interesting uh, set of panelists uh, gathered today. Uh, on my left is Dr. David Asher. Uh, he is now an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for Naval, I'm sorry, the um, Center for New American Security. Uh, and he has a very broad portfolio and has a very rich background. And I, I could talk about David for a very long time because he's a very close friend and someone I worked with uh, for quite some time. Um, but I won't. <coughs> to David's left is uh, Dr. Kim Jung-hoo, uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Export-Import Bank of Korea. Um, and uh, to his left is Mr. Yang Shiyu, uh, Senior Fellow at the Chinese Institute of International Studies. And to show you uh, the six degrees of separation, David and, and Mr. Yang have had prior contact during six party talks. Uh, so one way or another, we, it's a very incestuous group, I think, that we're all here together. Um, the very provocative introduction to this session uh, says that the international community has reacted to North Korean provocations with sanctions that have proven to be reactive rather than preventive. Well, that's uh, pretty much a, a demonstrated fact. That's what sanctions are. They always are reactive. Um, it says that they're ineffective because North Korea is making steady progress. Well, that is something I think we should discuss. Uh, and is it it's possible to have more effective smart sanctions? And I think that's what we're going to actually try to discuss, although I have not been able to preview uh, anyone else's presentation. Uh, but we will, we will try to grapple with all these topics during this session, and I'm going to ask each participant to limit their remarks to 15 minutes so we have ample time for audience participation. And by the way, I'm dual-hatted in, in this, and I'll, I'll be uh, also delivering a presentation uh, after they have finished. But with that, I want to uh, uh, ask David if, if he would uh, kick us off uh, with his presentation. Well, I'm very grateful to be here at the uh, wonderful Asan Institute uh, and uh, give a little uh, review of some personal history that uh, Mr. Newcomb and his previous job and I and many others uh, in the U.S. government and 15 foreign governments went through trying to come up with a non-kinetic uh, approach to applying pressure against a regime that had gone well outside the realm of its agreements with not just the U.S. and the ROK, but with the world, and that is the government of North Korea. This is sort of the first time I've ever given this sort of four PowerPoint background on this, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be a little brief on certain elements. But the key point for us in the, during the beginning of the Bush administration, we conducted a review of North Korea policy, uh, worked with the intelligence community, worked with our allies to really assess what, what the status was of North Korea's nuclear programs and where the status was of the talks. Um, we um, came to a conclusion rather quickly that the agreed framework was actually heading toward a train wreck, and that was largely because of North Korea's unwillingness to allow uh, uh, inspections, challenge inspections, uh, uh, in, in, in line with uh, the uh, criteria that had been set out, not just uh, by the UN, but also by the US Congress for transferring significant technologies needed to finish the reactors at the Kumho site. So basically, no matter what we did, we thought it was highly likely that unless North Korea totally changed its attitude toward inspections, the agreed framework was heading toward some type of collapse. We did not want that, but that was our conclusion. We also uh, did a very extensive review of, of, of our intelligence and consulted with uh, uh, subject matter experts as well in the, in the think tank world. And our assessment was that the, um, there was a lot less hope in the diplomacy than we had been led to believe. Um, 
and that the North Korea's own intentions toward negotiations were much less uh, proactive than uh, I think would have been publicly uh, um, concluded during the uh, four-party talks uh, and other engagements. But most importantly, we became aware of an emerging web of nuclear proliferation and nuclear clandestine uh, procurement activity involving the government of North Korea and partners around the world, including the uh, AQ Khan uh, nuclear proliferation network out of Pakistan. Um, this, is, this was something that absolutely uh, changed the views of everyone who started to see the information, including the government here, I think, um, over time. Uh, and, but at the same time, we, we were um, of the view that we could not afford uh, um, to use military force in any sort of proactive way as had been debated during the, Cl uh, the uh, Clinton years in 1994 uh, when uh, Yongbyon was almost attacked uh, to, in order to stop it and then Jimmy Carter came to save the day. We wanted to come up with some coercive diplomacy aspect that we could combine with the regular aspects of diplomacy to uh, and see if we could get the North Koreans to change their ways. And so I was instructed by the Secretary of State and the Deputy Secretary of State and by Assistant Secretary Kelly, who I reported to, to try to come up with some way of putting non-kinetic pressure on North Korea that, didn't, that, 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 would, that would have um, a, a, some chance of success at changing the regime's calculus. And basically the mission I was given by the National Security Council was to develop non-kinetic alternatives to military course of action to contain, counter-deny, and influence North Korea. It wasn't to topple North Korea, despite what people have said, okay. Um, uh, we, 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 we designed a, a program to, to look at the regime's vulnerabilities from the inside out and to create a model and understanding of what really mattered for Kim Jong-il's personal survival. And I can get into that uh, a, a bit. And what really mattered was just what's on this chart, which is a rough facsimile based upon some of the open source information. And that is that Kim Jong-il and now Kim Jong-un are basically surrounded by a, 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 what we Bill called a palace economy, um, which is supported by a variety of key institutions, uh, some of which have become merged together over the years. This map is not necessarily authoritative at all today. Um, uh, and it's, again, unclassified. But basically, Kim relied upon the different organizations of state security primarily and of, 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 of related to the military, specifically the Second Economic Committee, to develop um, uh, uh, streams of income, which typically would be kicked up to the top through what they call revolutionary funds transfers each uh, spring. Um, those activities ranged from a, a remarkable web of illicit activities, everything from heroin trafficking, methamphetamine trafficking, captagon trafficking, cocaine trafficking, trafficking and counterfeit cigarettes, um, actual rhino and, and uh, uh, elephant hunts conducted by North Korean ambassadors and, 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 and other senior officials uh, and officers of embassies in Africa to raise money, uh, a startling amount of counterfeit Viagra of high quality, which uh, I, I, I won't uh, allude to any further, um, and then a, a wide web of, of weapons trading companies which had partnerships with everything from the Khan network to a variety of entities uh, in, in, in variety of governments around the world. The key uh, uh, to, to our concept of, of, of operation to put pressure on them was to go after the money, but not to go after the North Korean people's money. The key was to go after Kim Jong-il's money, and that's what we proceeded to do. Um, and basically, when you mapped Kim Jong-il's financial personal network, all roads led to Macau, and we can talk about that in a bit. Uh, and um, rather than rely on an intelligence-driven effort, uh, such as had proven to be a disaster in Iraq, um, uh, uh, even before it had become a disaster in Iraq, we d were determined to do this in the, with, a, with a focus on law enforcement and rule of law. And so that whatever um, um, information we developed uh, that we could share around the world, we could do it at the unclassified, ultimately, level and have it be uh, used to build partner countries, law enforcement efforts, um, knowing that North Korea, in effect, had become, in our eyes, a criminal state. Uh, and I say that because the North Korean government at the highest of levels was in charge of the criminality. This was not being conducted by rogue agents at a low level. Um, some of the proof of the pudding was the amazing number of seizures that the Japanese government had, had um, uh, st uh, stopped uh, uh, of, of North Korean methamphetamine, the highest purity methamphetamine ever seized in the world at the time. 98% uh, plus purity, enough to kill probably everyone in this room with a couple drops of it. Um, but this had been going on for years, so it wasn't like they just started into this activity. This had become a main part of regime financing for the leadership of North Korea going on for years. And of course, we should have learned something 
uh, in South Korea, unfortunately, was unfor rather suppressed. This is a container of crystal methamphetamine. This is a, I think it's a 40-foot container of crystal methamphetamine coming off a ship, uh, uh, a Chinese ship called the Chuxing that was uh, detained at, uh, at, um, uh, by ROK authorities at the Port of Pusan, I believe, in, in uh, early 2002. That, so that should have set off an alarm bell. And it certainly, we, we saw, the more we looked at North Korea's web of list activities, the more we realized that, that by pursuing these illegal activities in of themselves, we could put pressure on Kim Jong-il in a way that would be very difficult for him to get out of. Um, not that we are out to necessarily, you know, send the guy off to, uh, off to the International Court of Justice, although that <laughs> certainly crossed somebody's mind uh, at some stage. But the whole idea was that we were going to be able to put pressure on his finances by freezing and forfeiting money uh, based on his own illegal acts that uh, we, we felt we could prove in court. And to do that, we developed a, a multinational uh, group of task forces, beginning with the Japanese, the Australians, Taiwanese, British, uh, and, and then we conducted two very large U.S. government, uh, Department of Justice, global transnational organized crime investigations, one called Royal Charm, the other called Smoking Dragon. In the summer of 2002, we began working very closely with the Japanese to cut North Korea off uh, from Japan, which was their main source of uh, financing. Um, uh, and uh, it, it centered around a ship called the Mang Young Wong 92, which I won't get into, but that ship was involved in conveying a wide range of contraband. Um, it, it extended into uh, operations uh, with the Australian government to detain a ship called the Pong Su, uh, which was tied to the North Korean government, on which uh, board was 150 kilograms of heroin, among other items. Uh, and from there it continued. This was something that was going on the entire time we were involved in diplomacy, including myself in the Six Party Talks. Uh, we worked closely with the Austrian government uh, to launch an investigation to Golden Star Bank, which was Kim Jong-il's uh, personal piggy bank in Europe. Uh, and uh, acting under their own anti-money laundering and, and, and uh, espionage laws, they decided on their own to cut it, cut it off. That was a very significant development. And then we began an effort that uh, was less successful but much more important to target this individual, Chung Byung-ho, and his uh, as, uh, reported um, son-in-law, Yoon Ho Jin, who interestingly had been the IAEA representative for North Korea in the 1990s when Dr. A.Q. Khan and others were floating around. Um, and um, had uh, turned himself into the leading uh, procurement agent for North Korea's enriched uranium program. Now, the part that sort of got the most attention in, in, the, in, in the wake of uh, the Banco Delta Asia was two large inv investigations we conducted with the FBI uh, and the U.S. Secret Service. And uh, those investigations revealed um, uh, via uh, elaborate sting operations that North Korea was engaged in selling tens of millions of dollars per year, per, per year contraband into the United States including counterfeit currency, counterfeit postage stamps, U.S. branded cigarettes, uh, uh, Viagra, XT methamphetamine, and most uh, alarmingly, offered to, a North Korean agent offered to sell a U.S. undercover agent 2,000 QF-14 man pads to shoot down airliners. Not the smartest thing to offer to somebody in the United States, uh, although they certainly didn't realize he was an FBI agent. We learned a lot about how the North Koreans were moving stuff around the world through illegal activities, and here's a case of, of uh, actual pallets uh, for toys that where North Korea was embedding counterfeit currency in them. Um, the biggest single element of North Korea's illicit fabric of support was actually counterfeit cigarettes. And what seems to have happened is the Chinese government cracked down on counterfeit cigarette production in the 1990s. Um, they moved into the criminal paradise, which was North Korea. Uh, North Korea became, uh, I think, the single largest producer of counterfeit cigarettes in the world. Um, and we started seeing North Korean counterfeit cigarettes showing up all over the United States. So some people say, well, where's the U.S. nexus? Well, actually, there was a lot more of it after we started investigating, we thought. And the, the, the main way we investigated this uh, with the U.S. government was to actually give uh, Kim Jong-il exactly what he wanted. We'd heard that he was a great fan of the TV show The Sopranos. So we offered him up uh, a genuine soprano. Um, uh, there happened to be an investigation going on into the Gambino crime family in the state of New Jersey. Uh, inside the game, you know, crime family was this individual, Jack Garcia, a.k.a. Jack Falcone, who had risen up to the highest levels of the Gambino crime family, uh, back to the highest level of any uh, American agent in, in, in Italian organized crime. And um, th he, through meetings that he conducted along with these two individual age, FBI agents, along with others, uh, the meetings were held with senior North Korean officials where all these criminal acts that were eventually detailed in the Banco Delta uh, case were uh, illuminated. And this is a little summary of how we ended up uh, bringing the operation down just for your entertainment. And then I'll stop.
Could you start the video? I don't know if it... U.S. authorities call it a growing threat to the security of our country, international organized crime. The New York FBI has hundreds of agents assigned to fighting it. And tonight, for the first time, two former agents show us how they got inside what's called the Asian mob. Our chief investigative correspondent, Armin Katayan, has the story. In October 2004, a freighter bound from China pulled into this port in Newark, New Jersey. A 40-foot container like this pulled off and cracked open by federal agents. Beneath false bottom boxes filled with plastic toys, the feds found hundreds of thousands of dollars in $100 bills, nearly flawless counterfeit cash known as super notes, traced to the government of North Korea. The people working on the notes were very, very shocked at the quality and, and actually how difficult it was to detect uh, the, the, the counterfeit nature of the currency. The seizure was part of an operation codenamed Royal Charm. Playing a key role was this rather odd couple, Louie and Z. They'd been working undercover in Atlantic City for six years, FBI agents posing as Italian mobsters who could get anything through customs. If you have the, the money and you have the credibility, um, it doesn't, doesn't matter. You could, you could virtually buy anything. Today, Asian organized crime traffics in everything from human cargo to fake Viagra to ecstasy to weapons. It feeds America's insatiable appetite for knockoff designer goods you find in flea markets and back alley shops across the country. Counterfeit Ralph Lauren, counterfeit uh, Nike Rolex watches. And brand name cigarettes, the biggest money maker. Manufactured for as little as $6 a carton in China, and sold on the street for up to $70 a carton, putting millions into the pockets of Asian mob leaders. In August 2005, the FBI decided it had enough evidence to move in. The dilemma, how to lure dozens of top Asian crime figures from as far away as China to one place at one time. So now we're all trying to figure out, you know, how are we gonna, how are we gonna pull this off? Their solution proved brilliant. An invitation to the mob wedding of the year with Louis as the groom and a female agent as his bride to be held aboard the luxury yacht, Royal Charm. Uh, we had limos. Uh, agents dressed in tuxedos picked them up at the casinos. And they were, you know, they were being told they're going to go to the yacht, Royal Charm. Um, but they had to make one more stop. And at that stop, they were, they were all arrested. Louis and Z have since retired from the FBI. They admit they missed the high life undercover, including counterfeit weddings that worked like a charm. Armin Kate in CBS News, Atlantic City. Well, the, the key point was that Royal Charm and Smoking Dragon c cooked off before uh, Banco Delta, and they were intimately related. That the evidence that underlined the Banco Delta accusations, uh, including the use of Banco Delta as a main funnel bank for criminal, this criminal network uh, was contained within those indictments. Unfortunately, what happened was through a variety of squabbles inside the government, much of that information was somewhat suppressed and, and, and it, the, the whole story has never really been told and still probably may never be told. But the key point I wanted to stress to you is that the U.S. policy uh, involving the use of Banco Delta Asia as a tool to as we said, kill the chicken to scare the monkeys, to, to, to scare the international financial community into complying with anti-money laundering provisions against the government of North Korea. And I can tell you those counterfeit cigarettes were coming out of North Korea. CBS News is wrong. They weren't coming out of China. They were just transiting China. Um, uh, the, the, that, that whole strategy was based upon the rule of law and based upon a vast body of evidence implicating the leadership of North Korea in transnational organized crime activity. Um, um, the, 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 let me just go to the end here, though. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, through a non-sanctions-based approach, it wasn't even smart sanctions, it was just an action-based approach involving law enforcement used strategically, we were able to freeze tens of millions of dollars. That, that was not really the direct impact. Hundreds of millions were immobilized or affected in the sense that banks just wouldn't let the North Koreans get access to their money once they realized that the North Koreans were involved in, in criminal activity. Um, we conducted five global undercover investigations that successfully proved beyond any reasonable doubt that North Korea's government at the highest levels was involved in a range of polycriminal activities, including counterfeiting U.S. dollar, 
uh, North Korea's uh, government was uh, indicted under racketeering and complex conspiracy in effect uh, and, and, and named uh, in the Sean Garland uh, indictment um, in, in 2005 in October. And we were able to take down strings of front companies and uh, 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 money laundering um, uh, and financial conduits for the North Korean regime without actually affecting the six-party talks. And if, I'll close by saying one thing with uh, uh, Professor Yang in the room. North Korea signed on to the important uh, declaration that he uh, uh, helped negotiate and write on the 19th of September of 2005. That was four days after Banco Delta was designated. And I've always believed that had Banco Delta not been designated, it is possible that they never would have signed that historic agreement. Uh, secondly, this, this uh, uh, process of applying pressure on the regime for the first time uh, put direct pressure, I'm told by defectors who have direct knowledge, uh, on Kim Jong-il himself, and he was put under tremendous duress, uh, as was uh, other elements of his leadership. So the extent that the goal was to try to drive a wedge between, the, uh, between nuclear weapons and regime survival and make the question of regime survival incumbent upon giving up nuclear weapons, I think we succeeded. On the other fronts, though, we didn't necessarily succeed as well, because we were hampered uh, uh, by uh, certain politics and certain other decisions, including unwillingness in this government at the time to take, to take on the full gamut of North Korea's global proliferation network. And the result of that is sort of illustrated on this slide. And I think we're going to be living for a long time in the future with the implications of that. Thank you. I'll, I'll save commentary on that, and I'll let you just kind of reflect upon what, what David presented uh, until we uh, open up for audience participation later. Um, what I'd like to do right now uh, is invite uh, Dr. Kim Jong-ho to make a, his presentation. Thank you for this chance. Um, I'm much honored uh, to be with all the experts on uh, finance and North Korea issues. Uh, first, let me introduce briefly uh, myself. Uh, I am a, a real case. Uh, I am living with three aliens. Uh, the first one and oldest one, the first and oldest one is called the wife. The second one is daughter. The third one is son. And the second and third aliens are also called teenagers. And they are all uncontrollable in terms of spending money. And I monthly provide the budget line and tell them clearly the income is limited. So spending must be limited. But they always go beyond the, uh, the bottom, the, the, the red line. Um, actually, I do not understand uh, the behavioral pattern of the aliens. Uh, I just try to adjust myself. Uh, to uh, daily life and the happenings every day. Um, well, I imagined uh, North Korean behavioral pattern uh, in that way uh, as if I face an alien um, and I try to understand the messages and signals from the actions and sounding. Um, North Korea has dual faces. Uh, one is uh, illegal and abnormal. The other uh, normal and legal. Well, North Korea is uh, one member of the United Nations um, that's run by the legalized institutions and run all the legal businesses um, and the people and the government um, have interactions regularly every day. But as David uh, the kindly explained about their illegal um, illicit behaviors, um, we are shocked and we uh, easily responded uh, to 
their actions and words. Um, we cannot accept uh, any part of uh, their philosophy uh, in the sense. Um, when the feudal leadership um, currently run by uh, a young, unexperienced Kim in North Korea, uh, still, still demands strongly for hard currency. And that is unchangeable factor. And we have closely uh, watched over uh, North Korean economic behaviors. And North Korea um, the, has increased its trade with uh, foreign countries. Uh, what is conspicuous is uh, the increase of uh, trade with China uh, for the past 10 years. Uh, but what matters more is that the North Korea's trade with China uh, has a featured trade deficit uh, whose size uh, has been around uh, almost uh, $1 billion at the maximum. Uh, well, uh, with our common sense, we do not understand how North Korea sells less and buys more without hard currency, without dollars, without yen. Uh, there must be some uh, cloudy part we cannot see clearly. Uh, when we contact Chinese officers and scholars, we always ask, to what degree China supports North Korea? And they become silent. Um, we just guess all the time uh, that cloudy part, the big gap between income and outcome uh, should, be, uh, should be supported in any way. So as David uh, presented, the illicit activities bring some money uh, to the Kim regime. And nowadays, the Kim Jong-un regime pursues and promotes more legalized uh, ways of uh, um, doing business. Uh, they send more people abroad, and they ask them to wire back more money. And the, they train their young people to absorb more advanced technology in order to produce more uh, values. And they have uh, more than thousands of uh, internet experts. Uh, they design, uh, well, the technology uh, apply the products and programs and softwares, and they sell through uh, many ways, and many channels. Um, well, North Korean regime uh, has been changing, has been shifting its focus from uh, provocation to uh, development at this moment. Uh, they they already announced that many development projects, uh, including uh, the ski resort and the another uh, economic zone um, or the tourism, so forth and so on. Uh, the channels for money inflow uh, included the wire transfer and hand carrying and the regular business payment. Um, but in North Korea uh, wants to uh, bring more money uh, by increasing the degree of attraction uh, toward uh, foreign investors. Uh, well, as you already uh, heard from the news media, uh, they agreed that with the South that, um, to reopen the Kaesong Industrial Complex, and they are so much uh, excited to talk about uh, Kumgangsan uh, tourism issues. Uh, 
um, well, South Korean government agreed with the North to to have a uh, IR ratio uh, over uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex. But North Korea tries to uh, garner uh, more resources for their development, and they try to uh, persuade outsiders uh, so they can uh, invest more. And they, after uh, changing the recognition of the North Korean regime at this moment. Um, <coughs> well, sources of hard currency for North Koreans um, included all the uh, legal and illegal uh, activities. Um, but uh, we need to be strategic uh, when we need to sharpen our tools uh, to leverage in North Korea. Uh, if this issue falls into the category of uh, social justice or humanitarianism, uh, we will all the focus on the, the stigmatizing North Korea. Well, it's, it's a bad country, okay? And nobody will uh, play with you, yeah. okay? Uh, step backward and move to another stage. We focus on the strategic um, the category. Uh, how can we stimulate North Korea or how can we persuade North Korea to move a little away from illicit toward legal activities? Well, it has been, it has been um, failure for the time being, right? Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, not only the U.S., uh, but also South Korea, um, well, Japan in the past too, um, has prepared uh, two cars at the same time, uh, sanctioning and dialoguing for economic cooperation. Um, well, the Korean Exim Bank uh, has been uh, managing the Inner Korean Cooperation Fund that, that has been used for facilitating Inner Korean uh, business uh, cooperation and exchanges and other activities. Um, but my institution has been very careful about the illegal uh, wire transfer or illegal activities involvement, so forth and so on. Um, the, when, we, when, when I uh, prepared for this uh, session, uh, one case uh, struck my head. Uh, that about 20,000 Mongolians staying in South Korea wire uh, around $100 million to home country every year particularly when South Korea Mongolian trade just reaches around uh, $40 million. So the wiring, wiring goes uh, beyond the uh, trade uh, volume. Uh, North Korean defectors are also uh, sending money uh, through transfer system uh, to their families in North Korea through China. They send money to uh, someone in China, uh, of course, uh, to Chinese banks, and they receive, and the brokers the, deliver the cashes to uh, the defectors' families. Well, these are all, uh, all known to everyone, um, but uh, the government has been um, paying more attention to uh, the details of a, uh, illegal uh, transfer of uh, cash or the, um, other values um, from South Korea to North Korea. Um, well, it is not easy to be smart in sanctioning North Korea. Um, well, if we, if we define uh, the purpose of a, a sanction as a blocking all the ways toward North Korea, 
Well, we can do that. But if we propose to move North Korea uh, from one point to the other, uh, we must be smart. We must pinch it where it hurts. Um, I'd like to uh, propose uh, some ideas how to be smart. Um, well, we can develop uh, smart ways of uh, sanctioning uh, after understanding uh, North Korea's uh, interests. Well, North Korean regime is interested in educating their people and sending uh, their people abroad and the import importing technology. Um, well, the, the, the loyal families travel frequently, and they do not use a credit card, but they use cash or debit cards. Debit cards are purchased easily, and the plastic monies are, they can be uh, carried at any time, and they are not uh, detected easily. Um, Royal families um, they send their children to foreign schools and they, they, they go shopping in a foreign country. Um, first target would be the royal family of North Korea. And the second target would be the North Korea's uh, businesses, the running companies or the um, they're trying to, to have it another chance in foreign countries. Um, well, the intelligence will bring uh, more wisdom to uh, academia, so we can analyze it, um, how to how to develop strategies. But uh, the it is not that easy, and the. South Korean government and the intelligence have been uh, have been the developing the institutional the tools, so the Korean uh, action uh, would be more useful and effective. Um, well, the, I will uh, bring back to the second round of a discussion uh, with more issues. Let me Thank you. Start. Mr. Yang. Thank Please. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, uh, express my thanks to uh, President Han and the ASEAN Institute to invite me to be here to present my observations and the views on the very important, but uh, to some degree sensitive issue on smart sanction. Could, Before, could you move the mic a little closer? Please? Sure. Uh, let me uh, express my uh, uh, thanks to uh, President Han and the ASEAN Institute to invite me to be here to present my observations and the views on the very important and uh, sensitive issue to some degree on smart sanction. Uh, before I go to my uh, presentation, I'd like to launch a preemptive, uh, preemptive uh, strike by making three fundamental questions to myself. Firstly, will North Korea truly denuclearize their nuclear arsenals? My answer, no. Uh, last week, uh, North Korean first deputy for Minister King Gui Kwan made a very clear statement in a track 1.5 seminar in Beijing. In my memory, in my record, that was the first since their previous provocative actions to state, to restate their determination of denuclearization. The wordings are very positive and very clear, more clear even than their previous statement. And I should be happy about his uh, statement, uh, along with uh, his assistant, Vice Minister 
Leon Hall's uh, remarks and uh, private chats uh, about their determination and uh, of the denuclearization. However, when we heard the newly uh, uh, published uh, statement on the denuclearization, we should bear in mind that the nuclear weapon has been in their constitution. The nuclear weapon development has been one of their focuses of their national strategy. So I made a joke to a friend of mine, of American friend, say, if I were you, the US government, you know, now the obstacle for, let me put it this way, the obstacle for resumption of secret house lies in the preconditional resumption or unconditional uh, 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 resumption. And the US asked North Korea to do something before restoring the Sixth Party Talks. For example, uh, letting IEA people uh, returning to the site and uh, freezing the enrichment and so on. However, I would say, let's make use of King Kui Guan's latest statement, but we need a higher maybe the top level's restatement. And the statement made by King Kui-Gwan was good. However, we need the top level statement just like King Kui-Gwan said. Because we have feel the contradictory statement say, on one hand, the decolonization is uh, King Yu Sun's uh, legacy of hope, uh, is, the, is the North Korean policy goal. However, we, uh, we also have heard the dual focus strategy and uh, uh, the constitution. So if the top leader of North Korea make a very clear statement that recommit to the denuclearization, there should be the matured condition for restore the uh, Sixth Party talks. There should be the signal of North Korea to show their sincerity of the denuclearization. That, that should be more important than some individual concrete measures uh, for restoring the uh, security talks. So no true intention to denuclearization. However, they, said they have sent mixed signals regarding to the nuclearization and denuclearization. Uh, and the second question, will North Korea go to collapse? My answer is no. Um, there, there have been some um, disputes about uh, collapse or no collapse. But I think the question for North Korea, facing North Korea, is not the question between collapse or survival, but the question between survival and the prosperity. In other words, I believe survival has been out of the question for North Korean regime. They have passed the most difficult period, say 1990s, mid-1990s. Now, no tangible, visible possibilities for the collapse. I can list a lot endless reasons. However, I would say, what I want to say is now, for North Korean leadership, they are not concerned about the possibility of the collapse, but concerned about the possibility of their ambitions plan 2020, say, prosperity, or something like that, or powerful, prosperous, socialist country, something. Remember, 2012 has been declared by North Korea as an opening gate for the prosperous, powerful, socialist country, but no tangible result for that year. And uh, they have a greater, more ambitious goal said, uh, listed by Plan 2020. There's a huge uncertainty about it. So now they are facing challenge, or they are facing a fundamental question between survival and uh, uh, prosperity, pro possibility of pro prosperity. Of course, the North Korean top leader, the leadership of North Korea, really want the prosperity not only the survival. Many analysts uh, are thinking how North Korean leadership make every effort to keep their regime survival. I don't think that is their policy goal. So they are 
they have been paying more and more attention to the possibility of prosperity. That is their true policy goal of Pyongyang now. And the third question, will sanction measures on North Korea work or will sanction measures be smart? My answer is, it will depend. Depend on what? Depend on how we, the international community, to combine a package policy tool, including sanction measures. In other words, sanction is sanction. No distinctions between smart sanction or stupid sanction. Make sanction smart or make, san san uh, make sanction smart lies in make sanction in one of the pillars or one of the elements in the package policy tools. That's the way of thinking towards the right solution to North Korean nuclear issue. Okay, uh, after the three sanction, uh, questions, uh, let me uh, go to uh, briefly my uh, presentation. North Korea is one of the very few countries that have been suffering from international sanctions for decades, especially the newly added sanction by UNIC Resolution 2094, which was the international community's response to North Korea's third nuclear test, have made the North Korean economy under more severe pressures and brought about a worse external environment for North Korea's economic sustainability. It is, however, almost in the same period when the external sanction pressures are increasing, North Korea's economic performances are obviously improving. Foreign visitors in Pyongyang have seen more construction sites, more free market activities, more lights at night, even more traffic jams. In short, all, almost all indicators uh, show that the North economy is affected little by the increased external sanctions. North Korea's economic improvement under more sanctions doesn't mean ineffectiveness of the sanctions. Exactly speaking, their economic, uh, their economy should have been in a better shape than now if there's no the increased sanctions. The mystery of their economic recovery lies in their own policy changes, say reallocating their limited national resources in more favor of economic constructions rather than their military buildups under the new guidance of dual focuses strategy. Uh, say, development of nuclear weapons and the development of a national economy. In my view, the dual focus strategy is a sort of replacement of Songun policy. On the surface, the dual focus strategy remains holding the military buildups uh, as one of the strategic focus. However, nuclear weapon development is, in reality, too specific to cover the previous military force politics in their planning economic regime. Furthermore, the new leader's dual focus strategy itself has replaced his father's military force policy and put a real core focus, development of the economy in practice at top priority. So in other words, the military first has been replaced by economic priority. The dual focus strategy truly indicates that the new leader, Kim Jong-un, wants both economic prosperity and the nuclearization for his country. That's why I said no intention to denuclearization. They want both economic prosperity and uh, nuclearization. But in reality, the two goals, economic development and nuclear weapon development, are totally in zero-sum game. On one hand, Developing and maintaining nuclear weapon arsenals keeps costing increasingly their limited internal resources that can greatly generate their economic development. On the other hand, their nuclear weapons blocked almost all opportunities of external resources that are prerequisites for their economic modernization. 
Such a zero-sum game between their nuclear strategy and economic strategy has actually brought strategic dilemma to the new leadership in Pyongyang and made implement implementation of the dual-focus strategy in an unsustainable way. In the context of a zero-sum game and unsustainability, the nuclear issue has become a matter of a cost of opportunity. Developing nuclear weapons has to be at a sacrificing economic recovery and the prosperity, and vice versa. Such a situation will gradually force the new leader to make a strategic choice between the two strategic goals, between the nuclear development and the economic development. The new leader understands better than any other one else that the nuclear weapon can indeed guarantee their national security. However, their national security can never be guaranteed only by nuclear weapons. Between nuclear and economic goals, the later one is far more vital than the early one. Cost of opportunity facing the North Korea is in fact more opportunities than challenges for international community as well as for a peaceful solution to the complex nuclear issue. To encourage North Korea make a right choice between the nuclear economic goals, the international community should build an architecture under which both comprehensive strategic benefits and the consequences are strong as well as tangible. If North Korea make a right choice, they will embrace bright future and prosperity. Their national security will stand on solid, peaceful ground rather than fragile mutual deterrence ground. If they keep going on their nuclear weapon program, consequences will put North Korea in more and more difficult situation leading to unsustainability. Regarding sanctions on North Korea, some people argue that sanction measures should play a preventive role, while some others think that sanctions are actually reactions against North Korea's bad behaviors. No matter what function, the, what function the sanctions command, policy goals cannot be achieved only by any kind of sanctions. My conclusion is, smart sanction lies in the comprehensive architecture mentioned above. In other words, smart sanctions are always accompanied and coordinated with multiple policy measures, which clearly show international communities both firm determination to denuclearization and the good willingness to North Korea's national security, show reachable comprehensive strategic benefits for North Korea's right choice on the nuclear issue. The problem for Im implementing smart sanctions now is in lack of such an architecture. The North Korea has understood clearly the consequences for nuclear provo uh, prov provocations through the existing varied sanction measures, but never feel tangible and the concrete benefits that can be translated into a bright future for North Korean prosperity. If Pyongyang truly choose denuclearization, what smart, what smart sanction regime needs is more bold and decisive diplomacy on the nuclear issue to build up a comprehensive architecture under which sanctions is just one of the pillars. So let me stop here to leave the time to the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I see that a lot of our topics are also spilling over into other panels that, that we'll yeah. be meeting tomorrow to talk about the economy and, and so yeah. forth. Uh, very interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm double-hatted. I'm also uh, going to provide a presentation. When I started, I really didn't introduce myself, uh, and I did that on purpose. Uh, my name is Bill Newcomb. Um, I'm from the United Nations, and my title is kind of uh, complex. Um, I'm a member of the panel of experts established pursuant to United Nations Security Council Resolution 1874. I think Gordon in this room totally understands that. Uh, generally, I find that while people are aware of the Security Council resolutions, uh, not so many have really read them. Uh, they've read about them, but they really haven't read them themselves. Uh, that perhaps doesn't apply to a lot of people that study international relations, but my economist friends, I think, have never really looked at the interworkings of sanctions regimes uh, other than perhaps just to scan them. Uh, and so what I want to do is talk a little bit 
uh, about sanctions regimes and the, um, the charge of, of this particular panel about smart sanctions and whether or not BDA-like uh, uh, procedures could be adopted against North Korea in lieu of what they, they say are ineffective multilateral sanctions. Uh, the first point to make, if you ask Danny Glazer, who's now the Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, about BDA uh, and Section 311, under which the action was taken, he will tell you that that was not a sanction. That was an administrative uh, regulatory action. Uh, it was a direction to U.S. banks that they needed to perform enhanced due diligence before dealing with Banco Delta Asia because they otherwise would be exposing the U.S. financial system to money laundering risk. And so enhanced due diligence is very expensive. And so U.S. banks made a cost-benefit choice about whether to deal with this bank or whether to shun this bank. And so banks began to shun it. Uh, when a bank gets shunned, uh, then there are certain consequences because the next thing you know, depositors in that bank want out of that bank. No one wants to do business with that bank. And so that's what happened in the, in the case of BDA, uh, which we didn't really have time to explore, but I wanted to make the point that BDA was not a smart sanction. Um, but it was definitely a targeted action. So, um, and smart sanctions are targeted actions. It's not a question of a difference between smart and silly. It's a question of broad sanctions versus targeted. Uh, and smart sanctions are trying to um, affect the decision-making calculus uh, of leaders to affect the vested interests of those who have a stake in what's going on but not to have unintended consequences, uh, or at least to try to avoid those. So if you read the language of the UN Security Council resolutions, you will see that they are directed not to have unintended humanitarian consequences, that they are not meant to inhibit the normal economic development of the DPRK. Now, the, the first resolution concerning this program uh, uh, was adopted in 1993. So we've had 20 years worth of Security Council resolutions about North Korea. Uh, the sanctions resolutions date from 1718 and 2006. Um, so they've been around for seven years now. Uh, Security Council resolutions, uh, well, let's take 1718. The Security Council directed member states to implement that within 30 days. Uh, and member states are supposed to report to the Security Council that they have implemented the uh, resolution. Implementation does not mean that the country is, that hasn't implemented isn't required to follow uh, the Security Council resolution. It is. It's a member of the United Nations. The action is taken under Chapter 7. Um, and uh, it is incumbent upon them to, to, to uh, uh, follow this. Uh, implementation is meant that it's done in a lawful way, that it's done in a way that also protects the member state that is, that is putting the sanction into effect. So uh, where do we stand now? I said it was seven years. Fifty percent of member states of the United Nations have yet to implement Security Council Resolution 1718. Um, where are they? Well. A lot of them, as you might expect, are capacity challenge states. Um, you find them in sub-Saharan Africa. You find them in Latin America, uh, the Caribbean, uh, Asia. Uh, in Europe, all but one have implemented. Um, so it's, it's a, a little bit spotty. It's understandable that countries that feel far from the action, uh, geographically distant, not having a, a sophisticated manufacturing sector, um, may feel that there's absolutely no priority for implementing sanctions. They're struggling with lots of other issues. They have a very limited ability just administratively to handle these things. It is often challenging to integrate nation, your national law in, with international law. Um, so you, you have more pressing problems, so this gets neglected. The DPRK seeks out weak links. The fact that you're distant doesn't make you immune to being utilized in a sanctions violation. So um, one of the jobs 
that uh, our panel has is to reach out and try to encourage member states uh, to implement these resolutions in an, in an effective way. The other thing we do is we investigate incidents of alleged noncompliance. I mentioned earlier in the question and answer session about the Chang Chang Gong. Uh, we were there in August uh, looking at the ship uh, and discussing things, and we'll be continuing to be investigating this. Uh, so anytime there's an alleged incident, we go and we try and learn from this, and we take what we learn and we report it up to the sanctions committee. Every time the United Nations passes a sanctions resolution, it creates a sanctions committee. Our sanctions committee is called 1718 after the resolution that established it. Our panel is named after resolution, as I mentioned, 1874, after the resolution that established it. The panel came into being in 2009 to assist the committee, as well as to make recommendations and reports to the Security Council. We file a final report to the Security Council once a year. Uh, about our activities and what we've learned, and we also make recommendations. Uh, in the context of this, we provide the report 30 days before it's due to the Security Council to the Sanctions Committee. It is not given to the Sanctions Committee for their review. It is not given to them for editing. It is just get, given to them for their advanced knowledge. Uh, the report that we file uh, one month in advance is exactly the same report that we file to the Security Council. After the Security Council has considered it, uh, they may or they may not decide to make the report public. The panel has filed four reports, three of which are public. Uh, they were all to be found on the uh, UN uh, web pages for the sanction, this particular sanctions committee. So you can go and you can look at what we've done and what we found in our recommendations there. What I really want to talk about, and I'll, I'll try to cover this fairly quickly with just a few illustrations. Um, is effectiveness of sanctions. I already mentioned that implementation is a challenge that, that can interfere with the effectiveness of sanctions. But there are other things that have gone on. And, and actually, Gordon stole my thunder a little bit because we have seen tremendous amount of progress uh, in sanctions. Smart sanctions are not designed by smart people sitting in a room devising something perfect. Smart sanctions are a political process where political decisions are made in a, in a, in a struggle session, right? Lots of bilateral consultations take place, trying to figure out what each party uh, thinks is correct that they can live with, right? And over time, we have seen uh, increasing amounts of cooperation in trying to strengthen the sanctions regime that applies to the DPRK. For example, 1718 gave designation authority. It didn't designate anyone for either an assets freeze or for a travel ban. Designations didn't happen until 2009. Um, the, original seven, the original sanctions resolution, uh, it prohibited trade in arms, and it defined it, battle tanks, armored, combat vehicles, aircraft, etc. Uh, 1874 and 2009 made it all arms and related. Uh, so they definitely expanded there with the exception of uh, uh, small arms and light weapons, which the DPRK was allowed to continue to buy as long as the committee was notified. Um, Nuclear related, uh, ballistic missile related, and other WMD related items, it, that's all list based prohibitions. Uh, and when the news reports about China implementing uh, uh, Resolution 2094 were published, what they're talking about is China publishing uh, the expanded list. It's about 236 pages of list based, based items, uh, including some dual use items based upon the NSG list and so forth. Uh, so that has been normal sorts of progress. Uh, where we have had some difficulty is in the category of luxury goods. I think everyone was surprised when luxury goods popped up in 1718. And that was not changed until 2094 when a small, non-exhaustive list of luxury goods was added. Luxury goods is kind of the gift that keeps giving. Um, on the one hand, um, the presence of luxury goods in Pyongyang uh, is looked upon as sanctions being a failure. People generalize from the fact that they see uh, uh, 
large flat screen TVs being loaded onto Air Corio and flown in. Uh, they fixate on a purse that's being carried by the wife of Kim Jong-un. Uh, they note that there are watches uh, being advertised, that there are expensive perfumes and so forth. And so they say, well, obviously sanctions are a failure. Well, luxury goods are kind of unique because it's left to each member state to determine what a, a, the list of luxury goods is. Some member states have published the list, some have not. Uh, sometimes they define it differently. Uh, the Swiss were the first to come up with a list of luxury goods. Um, the EU learned from the Swiss, um, but they're not quite the same. Uh, for the European Union, a luxury watch is a watch that has a value threshold of, of 100 euro. The Swiss think they know a luxury watch when they see one, their threshold is 1,000 euro. So you have all these different discrepancies. You also have the problem of secondary distribution because once you sell it to a distributor, uh, what's to prevent uh, a DPRK diplomat transiting Hong Kong from buying five Rolexes in a jewelry shop for cash and walking out with them? Not a darn thing, right? So luxury goods is, is very difficult to enforce uh, and there is uh, an, uh, no shortage of it in Pyongyang, but it is not something by which you can, marry, you can measure the effectiveness of other sanctions. Um, what we have seen, uh, and certainly uh, if uh, Joshua Pollock is right, uh, sanctions were working for a while. They worked so hard they made North Korea uh, invest very heavily in some very specialized capabilities. Uh, and, I mean, it's a very worrisome finding. I want to talk to him more about the evidence that he's using for it. Uh, it. It's challenging in terms of thinking what the future might be. But in hindsight, it also says that, for, at least for a while, sanctions were working pretty well. well. How do we judge? I'm going to try and wind this up fairly quickly. How do we judge if, if sanctions are working uh, or not? Uh, well, are, we, are member states making interceptions? Yes, they are. Chang Chang Gong is just an example, but there's lots of others. So we see that the interception regime is, is working fairly well. Um, we're not picking up a lot of WMD in that. Every now and then, but not, not a lot. Uh, mostly it's arms and related equipment. Um, we're finding uh, states are becoming uh, less tolerant of this, and they now have new tools. Uh, 2094 gives member states a catch-all provision, so if they just believe uh, something could contribute to prohibited programs, they now have the authority to stop it. 2094 now gives states the ability to designate individuals and to uh, expel DPRK individuals that are involved in incidents. They're not restricted simply to those that are designated um, under the Security Council or by the 1718 Committee. Um, member states um, have the ability to freeze assets, not only of designated individuals, but of those that operate on their behalf for them, those that may be controlled by designated individuals, and most recently, those that help designated entities or otherwise help in the evasion of sanctions. So the whole scope of member state authority has been widened greatly. And 2094 is really, uh, I think, a watershed that was underappreciated uh, when it was uh, uh, adopted. So um, what else do we look at or what can't I look at? Let me put it that way. We have some problems. The asset freeze. While the member state is required to report upon an, uh, an inspection or a, a seizure of prohibited cargo, member states are not required to report upon an assets freeze. So if, if they made an assets freeze, they'll report it internally. There's no requirement for them to report it externally. They're not required to report if they have uh, picked up somebody on the travel ban or one of their family members on the travel ban. So I do not know if the assets freeze is effective or not. I do not know if the travel ban is effective or not because I'm not getting any reporting. We have asked member states to consider reporting this uh, and perhaps that'll help us get a, a better metric on how effective this is. But let me tell you uh, just one example. Uh, 
When Tanchon Bank was designated in 2009, Tanchon was the military bank, as probably most of you all know. Uh, it had a global footprint. Yet I don't know of any assets that got frozen uh, of Tanchon because none of these were reported. So we have our, our challenges to smart sanctions. At the same time, we have an arc of development, uh, particularly in the financial area, where uh, we see sanctions are tightening. Um, and to close, uh, we have been able to do a couple of things to help uh, member states and others. Uh, if you look at what we put in our most recent report, at the very end in the appendix, we now we published a list of banks operating in the DPRK. We have published a list of those designated that includes uh, the name they use in Korean. So, and it's not a translation. One of the problems with the application of sanctions is false positives. One of the problems with the application of OFAC sanctions on the SDN list is that you don't really know very much about the name of who's being uh, sanctioned. Uh, so what we try to do is provide member states with a little bit more knowledge. Uh, for example, green pine is Chongsong, but there are lots of green pines around. But we now at least have the Korean name of, of Chongsong officially listed in the designation list. I, I could actually probably take up hours, uh, but I'll stop here so that you all can ask questions. Thank you very much. Um, why don't I, I'll just go this way and, and, and start with Peter. Peter Beck from the Asia Foundation. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, to what extent have you, were UN sanctions informed by, influenced by Bush administration efforts to crack down on, on North Korea's illicit activities? My second question is, uh, to what, you know, since David really led this crackdown on their illicit activities, they seem to have shifted away from drugs and counterfeiting, at least in terms of media reports. The most recent one that I'm aware of, and I don't know if it's been confirmed, is in uh, drug smuggling in Mongolia a couple months ago. At least I've heard reports about. But those are comparatively rare. There was no, unquestionably a wave uh, in the early 2000s that, that you dealt with. And I'm wondering what, in your opinion, uh, explains uh, this this trend? Is it that you were so good at finding, uh, tracking down their activities that they decided to go into other lines? Is it that China, uh, this booming uh, trade and investment with China, that, they've, that they can have enough, there's enough legal means? I think you were quoted once as saying, North Korea is so good, uh, David was quoted once, I've, I've heard it's no, North Korea is so good at, at illicit goods production that if they switch to legal production that they would be a very successful economy. To what extent are they following your advice, or at least uh, working with China uh, to, to get out of the drug and counterfeiting business? Or are we just not finding it? Um, let's, let me try the, I'll, I'll just pick on the first part of that, uh, Bush administration efforts. Um, I am sure that the Bush administration efforts helped inform um, the uh, sanctions that the U.S. would propose uh, in negotiations with other members of the Security Council. Uh, but the Bush administration effort certainly didn't inform uh, all the other members that also had to agree to what was adopted. And there's one other distinction that we could make, uh, whereas the, the Bush administration with the various uh, executive orders uh, took account of illicit activities. Uh, Union Security Council resolutions are not directed at illicit activities. They're only directed at prohibited programs. Uh, we don't uh, look into uh, or take any account of uh, uh, counterfeit currency, counterfeit cigarettes, counterfeit uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, or, or um, Nar narco traffic or anything like that. The only way we would take action on that is if it could be demonstrated that the proceeds uh, were used to further prohibited programs, like develop, you know, purchasing uh, prohibited uh, um, uh, precursors or something like that uh, for, say, chemical weapons. David. Um, it's a very interesting question and, and important. I, I think, we, you know, we did have a secondary goal of trying to drive them out of these illegal, illegal rackets with the goal, as uh, Professor Yang will 
can confirm that we wanted to engage them on a broader economic transformational path. We spent, uh, two of us, a tremendous amount of time planning that pathway uh, and actually did present it to the North Koreans. And of course, the reaction of the North Koreans was this would threaten our very survival. You know, the, the capitalism is, is, is our enemy. Um, but the interesting implication of having really taken their, a lot of their legal networks down around the world um, and them being aware that there is much more to come if they continue does seem to be that they have abandoned a large tract of the most egregious, aggressive, illicit activities uh, outside of weapons proliferation, at least, that I'm more concerned about on the nuclear front. But when it comes to just the counterfeiting, cocaine trafficking, all this, you've seen, you've seen a remarkable drop in incidences that have been reported publicly. And since typically the people that would um, find out about these would be the police services of the world, we sort of would be able, as academic researchers, to, to know. So I would say verifiably we've had a big impact, and I think it probably has stimulated a more reform-oriented mindset. Um, it's a bit of the, what uh, Professor Yang was saying, you need to have this combination of policy and strategy to encourage these North Koreans. They're just not gonna voluntarily get, I mean, why would they voluntarily give up this incredibly profitable business that just happens to be illegal when they don't even care about international law unless they're absolutely forced to. Uh, so I think in that sense it was uh, relatively successful. Hi, my name is Narushige Michishita from uh, the National Institute, Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. I have one question to Bill and one question to David. One uh, question to Bill is uh, uh, recently, after you know, supposedly uh, China became more proactive in, in implementing or imposing sanctions on North Korea. North Koreans, you know, suddenly gotten quite you know, got quite, uh, you know, less provocative and friendly. So uh, how do you evaluate uh, quality and effectiveness of uh, uh, Chinese sanctions on North Korea in recent months? And uh, how do you um, assess the relationship be between Chinese sanctions on North Korea and the, the change in North Korean behavior? And uh, another question to David <coughs> is uh, if uh, we had uh, continued to impose uh, sanctions imposed, I mean, on North Korea after uh, 2000, over, you know, uh, beyond 2007. You know, this is, I'm, I'm asking for your wild guess, but uh, what do you think would have happened? Thanks. Thank you for that question. Um, in, in terms of uh, what China's doing, there, there are two things. Uh, uh, one is that uh, what I read is that they have cooperated um, with the U.S. Treasury um, on the um, sanction that uh, OFAC adopted on foreign trade bank, uh, and that certain Chinese banks are no longer um, hosting correspondent accounts. Uh, that is not uh, a designated entity by the UN, but it certainly it is having a profound effect upon the transfer of funds in and out of the DPRK, uh, which is putting them under considerable pressure. Uh, the second thing is uh, news reports that uh, customs agents are becoming more vigorous in examining cargoes going in and out. Uh, I think that that is uh, absolutely a positive development. Um, the publication of the new list, uh, in, which includes the dual use goods and so forth, I think is a very positive development. And I, th I think also, and uh, I don't want to speak for Chinese authorities, of course, but um, when I mentioned the threat posed by hazardous cargo, uh, hazardous cargo, uh, we've documented the fact that it has transited Dalian. So Chinese ports have been put at risk. If you want to understand what can happen to a port, go ask Cyprus. They had a cargo blow up. Um, so, you know, this is not, again, something theoretical. Uh, they, they ship um, arms and ammunition. Uh, the aircraft that was stopped in Thailand, uh, it not only had RPGs, it had uh, um, TBGs, um, thermobaric 
right? That's used in urban warfare. Uh, so, I mean, this is the nature of the kinds of arms shipments that, that are being sent out there. So I, I think what you're seeing is a, a, not only a recognition that North Korea probably needed a stronger signal sent to it, uh, but a recognition that this is necessary protective measure. But again, I can't speak for them. Perhaps uh, Mr. Yang will. Well, should I just answer the question that, Please. look, I, I think uh, had we maintained and indeed expanded as we were prepared the financial action plan, the campaign plan that we had prepared and that was going to be rolled out globally uh, in the wake of the Banco Delta designations and the wake of the Royal Charm and Smoking Dragon operations, uh, we would have had the ability to freeze hundreds of millions of Kim Jong-il's personal wealth. Whether we had the full cooperation of partners or not, I think we had a treaty framework worked out with our allies, and we'd identify the assets through law enforcement means, uh, grand jury subpoenas and other means, and, uh, that would be not, not intelligence, stuff that would be accepted by foreign law enforcement partners, uh, including our, our partners in China. Um, and we would have had the ability to, to crack down on Kim's own personal financial lifeline. And had we done that, I think we would have had a very good discussion with Kim Jong-il himself. And I think that was a tr tr tragic strategic mistake. Um, we never should have gone down the road of imposing these actions without actually following through because the whole idea was to support the six-party talks. It was to know the six-party talks was going to be the form where you're going to sort of create the framework to get out of this nuclear coffin that he'd stuck his regime in and to open his country up to prosperity. But there was no way he was going to give up on his nuclear program unless he faced an existential threat to his own survival. And I think that, you know, we did actually threaten his survival, but we, we, were, we provided an insufficient level of threat. Had we frozen this money in you know, many capitals around the world which have treaties with the United States and with the 15 other governments that were joint investigative partners, which is very important, it wasn't just us, I think that, uh, that, that, that Kim would have responded uh, uh, favorably because he would have had no choice. Um, and um, we unfortunately just failed to follow through on that. And, 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 and you know, that's, that's, that's the danger of playing uh, nuclear and financial hardball uh, and, and uh, taking away uh, the pitcher from the game. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Ye Jin. I uh, coordinate China, Japan, Korea cooperation, the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. Um, my question is, um, you, uh, Mr. Nukom, you touched upon the difficulty of implementing those sanctions. And we understand that coordination is such a thankless job, especially getting member states to submit reports and information. So I'm just wondering if there are any ways to create incentives for member states to be more diligent in terms of submitting reports and the information that you need for sanctions to be effective. And the other question is, um, I understand the panel and the sanctions committee do not necessarily have the judici judici judiciary power or the investigative power. So is there any way to expand the mandate of the sanctions committee or the panel to maybe work with the, any of the judiciary bodies within the United Nations to be more effective in their work? Uh, in terms of offering incentives to member states, uh, the incentive to the member state is that uh, by, by adopting properly uh, and implementing the resolutions, they're actually protecting themselves. Uh, for example, in 2094, there's a force majeure clause um, which protects them from legal action um, on the, uh, taken... Uh, by those who they might affect. For example, you seize a container. If somebody owns that container, they get a rent from that container. They can't sue you because you seize that container as, as part of uh, an inspection in terms of implementing Security Council resolutions. Or you, you hold a ship at port uh, while you conduct an inspection. So all of these things grant you an immunity f uh, from suit because you're acting um, under this authority. So by adopting that, you mean you're really protecting yourself. Uh, that's just one particular example. But uh, the Security Council itself is, doesn't have uh, the means or uh, probably would never even consider trying to offer some kind of uh, positive inducement. Uh, members are expected to carry these things out, particularly when they're done under Chapter 7. Um, 
And then the uh, second part of your question was, um, I'm sorry. Uh, expand the mandate. Uh, we, as you noted, uh, we do not have subpoena power. So we depend upon the cooperation of member states uh, to do these investigations. And personally, I, I don't think I really need subpoena power. Um, so I, I don't think we're going to get it. I don't think it's something I'd ever ask for. Uh, in terms of other uh, resources, we do have the ability to work with Interpol and can call for things from Interpol. Sir. Uh, you said in your presentation about the uh, United Nations sanctions uh, that uh, they are not intended to have a normal economic activity and so on and so forth. But uh, don't you see that some countries are unilaterally want to expand these sanctions on a normal economic activity? For example, a recent uh, refusal by some uh, European companies to sell equipment for this ski resort in North Korea. And several years ago, there was a big, uh, I would say, hysteria in media about the North Korea selling a stock of jeans made by some uh, English uh, North Korean joint venture in Stockholm, one of Stockholm supermarkets. And the one uh, more early example, um, this country during Kim Tae Jun, Nomu Hyun administrations uh, got uh, negotiations with the uh, United States about free trade agreement. And uh, this country uh, wanted uh, very much uh, goods produced in Kison industrial zone be included in this agreement. But United States were strongly opposed to the idea. I am just wonder what harm to world economy, to uh, United States economy will do uh, several millions goods produced in Kison, which certainly no, no related to North Korean missile or nuclear problem uh, uh, to um, uh, anybody. Because if we want change in North Korea, we also should give incentives. We should, um, uh, hope, uh, we should um, help to establish uh, some agent of change in North Korea, some people who will be interested in stable, endurable relations with foreign countries, uh, with foreign markets, and so on and so forth. But in reality, some countries actually push North Korea in every possible way, in the field of jeans, in the field of ski <laughs> equipment, in the field every possible field back in trenches of Cold War. So I think a, a very timely presentation of our Chinese colleagues that sanctions will not work if they will be not combined with very clear incentives. Incentives very important. And uh, I, uh, my second question, very short, to my uh, South Korean colleague. Uh, do you think that if South Korea will follow all this set of sanctions, do you think it will promote trust process on Korean Peninsula as your new president advocated for? Thank you. Why don't you start? Sorry. Well, uh, that I understand, trust politics is based on a uh, strong uh, position against the North Korean provocation. So. Uh, sanction would be included in the options for uh, punishing and correcting North Korean bad behavior. Uh, the basic position of this government is that uh, no, be no bad behavior would be rewarded. Um, but nonetheless, on the other hand, uh, this government is providing all the uh, ways uh, of uh, dialoguing with uh, North Korea or over uh, over uh, many issues, including Kaesong, Kumgangsan, and others. Um, well, it, it seems to be um, a kind of a, a contradiction um, the, between those, but the policy tools are put on the table at the same time, and the, it is a given uh, to North Korea 
um, which to choose. About the first part of your question, I, I think Mr. Young um, also touched very much upon this particular point uh, about having the uh, development path, uh, positive path ahead of them. Um, the Security Council resolutions, uh, as I mentioned, um, are not meant to uh, inhibit this. Uh, they are directed at trying to make sure that monies provided or trade credits provided aren't uh, used to support the prohibited programs. But they certainly are not trying to interfere with uh, normal trade. Um, they are not trying to uh, interfere with, with um, uh, acquisition of, of uh, grain, for example, or, or any of these things. When it comes to the ski resort, uh, the one, one European country uh, reportedly classified the ski lift as a luxury good. That is uh, what, it's within its sovereign right to do so. Because the determination of what luxury goods are and are not is left to each country to determine. With the exception now of, of just a few things like jewelry, yachts, and racing cars um, that have been uh, finally described as luxury goods. So, uh, you know, how you determine that the ski resort's a luxury good is dependent upon how you view this. Do you view it as part of a tourist-led uh, economic development program for the North? Um, I'm not quite sure the uh, viability of this kind of strategy, but I guess it's possible. Um, or do you view it as a place where the, the uh, elites will go for recreation? Uh, and if it's a place where the elites are going to go for recreation uh, because they don't feel comfortable going to Switzerland anymore, well, perhaps it is a luxury good. But that's for the member state to determine. Other member states could determine it's not a luxury good and provide it. In either case, uh, the UN wouldn't have a, a voice in that. Um, so, but we're trying to, to offer in the resolutions the Security Council, I mean, Again, resolutions are developed by consensus of the 15 members of the Security Council. And they're trying to offer North Korea two ways. Um, the good way forward, or if you continue this, you're going to continue to run into these sanctions problems, and we're going to continue to stiffen them. We're going to continue to push on uh, the financial angle. Um, and in terms of that, uh, there's an awful lot of leverage that finance receives. For example, 2094 makes reference to the Financial Action Task Force. It is the only Security Council resolution I know that does so. Um, and it's aimed at uh, stopping proliferation finance. So, I mean, there are lots more tools out there that can be brought to bear uh, on the DPRK. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, uh, the tool chest has a, a lot more in it. Uh, and the Security Council will consider those if provocations continue. But other than that, if they want to uh, invest in a cement industry uh, to bring in the kilns and so forth, there's absolutely nothing in Security Council resolutions that would forbid that, and actually it would be encouraged by all the members, I think. Would you like to comment on, on this as well, please? Well, well um, I'd like to... Uh introduce some of Chinese practices on the current uh, sanction regimes. Basically, uh, we have uh, three categories of efforts relating to North Korea's economic ties with China. One, of course, based on uh, uh, UN sanction regime, we support the uh, resolution, uh, the serious resolution. Uh, so whenever the sanction uh, regime prohibit uh, the sanction, uh, transactions and we 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 abide by uh, that's that part is very clear for Chinese they never uh, import uh, the so-called luxury goods from China and the Chinese the government uh, seldom to face the question whether or not this is luxury or non-luxury uh, goods but basically we uh, as a one of the major provi providers for China, uh, North Korea's economy, we, our category, list of the goods are qu quite clear. For example, for the, uh, during the past decades, 
uh, uh, China provided a lot of weapons to North Korea. Now, none of the weapons export to North Korea at all because of the UN sanction regime, that's clear. And, uh, but as to the humanitarian, like uh, food, like uh, heavy fuel oil, and even uh, textile uh, products, uh, uh, no problem, no question about that. And the second part is uh, relating to the sanction regime, but not direct relationship with the, that is the uh, uh, export control regime. Uh, even before, far before the UN sanction regime was launched, we have set up the uh, export control regime, uh, partly copied from the United States in 1990s. Uh, not designed specifically to North Korea, but for our safety, our national security. And of course, uh, North Korea uh, are very interested in uh, importing some of uh, dual-use goods for their uh, missile or nuclear programs. Uh, but we have a very strict uh, censorship. And uh, under our commerce ministry, we have an expert group to censor almost every uh, transaction between Chinese enterprises and the North Korean ones on dual-used goods. That means, uh, you know, the military-used goods, of course, no, uh, not at all. But for dual-used goods, we have a very s a thorough uh, censorship regime that are uh, closely relating to the uh, sanction regime of UN. And the third part, no relationship with uh, sanction regime, that is uh, based on Chinese legal system. Say, there have been a lot of illegal activities, uh, trading activities between China and uh, North Korea, just like uh, you know, between China and some uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so re regarding to China and North Korean illegal activities, we have increased our efforts to crack down the, uh, uh, the illegal uh, activities. Uh, in, many, uh, in some of the cases of illegal activities really relating to some prohibited uh, uh, goods uh, listed by UN regime, but uh, uh, basically uh, we implement uh, we implement the enforcement uh, on the illegal uh, cracking down illegal activities based on Chinese law rather than the, based on the uh, UN sanction regime. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I. We're, we're running short of time. I, I have uh, one person I've already promised a question to. Let me open the floor to uh, say two more very brief questions because I know everybody wants to get out of here. It's been a long day. So, sir. Thank you. I'll try to be as quick as I can then. Uh, my name is David Cooper. I'm from Yonsei University. I did, finished recently and I work at uh, Western Pacific Research. It's a political consulting firm in California. But um, I wanted to make a comment um, with regarding to Professor Yang's um, contrast between smart sanctions and dumb sanctions. And there was a sort of a, a case study I did sort of as a, a senior thesis regarding uh, sanctions with Iran, for example. And it had to do with uh, the implementation of using the SWIFT system involving sanctions. For example, if you well, if a bank were to trade with Iran and um, they would be, you know, sort of deleted from the SWIFT system as sort of a response. And um, I thought this was kind of an extreme one because you've used the SWIFT system as a weapon now. And sort of uh, uh, the Chinese and the BRICS response to that because they have multi-billion dollar investments in Iran, similar, although not as much as in North Korea, was to create a, a, a BRIC development bank to try to circumvent uh, the sanctions against Iran. And sort of, I thought that was sort of counterintuitive because one, you have alienated uh, nations like uh, Russia and China who you need to cooperate in order to deal with the North Korean issues. And second, you've decreased the demand of US dollars because SWIFT is sort of, you know, dollar domi uh, dominated. So I just had a question for the rest of the panel, although more specifically for Professor Yang, you know, has any of you, have any of you studied this case and have you learned anything from this? And you know, are there any sort of uh, advice to how to overcome this uh, setback with regarding uh, sanctions like that? Thank you. Uh, Gordon? A question for the full panel, but particularly for uh, Dr. Young. I'm wondering that with North Korea advocating this policy of Pyongyang, the simultaneous development of nuclear you know, capability and economic thing, 
if they haven't changed fundamentally our approach. Because we've always wanted to say, as Bill Newcomb said, according to UN rules, that we're not opposed to cement factories and economic development. But now that North Korea has formally declared itself a nuclear power and formally declared a policy of pursuing both, clearly if we're trying to get them to make a decision, we are opposed to this policy. We're opposed to the simultaneous development. Which seems to me that means that we are now opposed to North Korean economic development, not just missiles, not just the nuclear weapons program, not just the specifics. We're opposed to them successfully carrying out the simultaneous development of nuclear weapons and their economy, which means our opposition needs to be broader. Otherwise, we're, there's, we're not making them make a choice. So I guess the question I really have is, you know, after having declared itself a nuclear power and declared a policy of Yongjin, have we crossed a line with North Korea in terms of how targeted our sanctions really are? Yeah. One more, uh, if there is one. Uh, thank you. For, I was, uh, I'm Dr. Lee Seung-yeol uh, from UI University. As uh, I ask a question, Dr. Siang, as about uh, your answers uh, about the trading, as uh, uh, I think it's the main source of main income of the North Korea is a um, uh, trading company, as an exporting company, as the over the 70 percent of the foreign currency is. Uh, uh, they buy the, this uh, company is run by military. As the main actor is the uh, carry out um, uh, test of nuclear as uh, some kind of the launch and the long range missile as by some military groups. So uh, I think it's this money used by uh, some use and some kind of the source of nuclear test and some uh, long range missile. And so, and this money must be prohibited by sanction on the, as according to the resolution and the UN United Nations and the Security Council. What do you think about this? Thank you. Uh, since this, these were the last questions, perhaps, uh, Mr. Yang, if you could take about, uh, say, three minutes or so to pick and choose how you, how you answer, and then Everyone else has about a minute for any concluding comment that they would like to make, and we'll wrap this up. Uh, well, implementing a UN sanction regime for China is a very sophisticated and complicated issue, and uh, every level of government uh, do a lot of efforts to make the distinction between normal and uh, prohibited uh, uh, transactions. Uh, as regarding to Gordon's uh, question, um, we are trying to divide, you know, they have a new focus strategy. We oppose development of nuclear and support the economic development. Uh, we hate to see our efforts uh, on sanction to hurt or impede North Korea economic development, development. We encourage them to do that by, number one, normal economic ties, and then number two, introducing China's knowledge, even lessons, to North Korea regarding to their reform and openness. Uh, as to the individual cases for uh, implementing uh, sanctions, uh, I, to be honest, I don't have a you know, uh, concrete idea or information about that, but uh, I'm confident and I have a lot of cases, uh, examples to show uh, more and more restrictions for North Korean companies in doing business in China that may be the, the, the side effects uh, produced by the sanction regime. Thank you. Well, um, for South Korean government, um, as well as the South Korean academics and the practitioners are all thinking about how to um, the, the release it. Um, the tough regulations over inter-Korean relations. Well, March, no, 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 uh, May 24th uh, decision uh, in 2010 have becomes a big obstacle for inter-Korean economic uh, cooperation um, that would be, that would resume soon. But uh, nonetheless, the government is uh, uh, focusing on 
the, how to be uh, smart. Well, there is no other way, <laughs> no other word, um, in dealing with North Korea. So, the, well, two aspects of money inflow into North Korea include um, the one can be negative to support North Korean uh, weapon development. The other uh, is a pos positive effect over North Korean uh, perception to change uh, toward the, um, the possession rights and the economic relations in the planned economic system. Well, <clears throat> I don't have a answer on SWIFT that will necessarily please you, except that it has driven the Iranians, uh, among other measures, to the negotiating table with the P, um, P1 plus 5 and Rouhani making a apparently historic uh, presentation today at the United Nations uh, General Assembly. So uh, whether we can really trust them or not, there's no doubt that the impact of the pain that these financial actions, uh, including sanctions, smart or otherwise, have imposed upon a nuclear defiant nation, uh, in the case of uh, Ir Iran, have been substantial and largely successful. So. We're, um, I think overall, I think that the, the track record of this policy framework is uh, pretty good. Uh, one, one brief comment about, uh, to respond to Gordon, I, I think the objectives are mutually exclusive, so I'm not really concerned about making a sanctions uh, adjustment. Um, and with that, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Young, Mr. Kim, Dr. Kim, uh, Dr. Asher, and for your patience in having this thing go on and on and on. Thank you very much.